Hi, thanks for joining us today. We're going to do a walk through the trials, the annual trials. But before we get going, I just want to tell you a little bit about why we trial and what we trial here. So we're part of the All America Selections um, trial program. Uh, we take participants as well, uh, other participants other than the All America Selection program. Uh, so we're what would they call a fee for fee for use or trial uh, site. Um, we have 12 different companies that are in our trials this year, so we appreciate their participation. And um, I'm sorry, I need to grab. I wanted to show you that we do labels. Oh, thank you. We do um, labels on all of our plant material. And on these labels, uh, you'll see at the top that it tells you where it's located in the garden. The next will be what it is. Then it's the scientific name, or I'm sorry, it's the cultivar. Then it's the, uh, what it, uh, the uh, genus that it's in, or yeah, that it's in. And then we have um, at the very bottom, the source of where you can find the, these plants uh, or seeds, as well as who is paying to enter it into the trials. If it's new to us that year, you'll see a new banner in the upper corner of the label. One, um, Important thing is to know that we trial in many different ways. You can enter, and this is decided by the company that submits these entries. They can decide whether they want the entry to be grown in full sun or under the shade. And as you can see, we have a, st a shade structure behind me. They can then decide, do they want to have it grown as a hanging basket? Do they want it as a container? Do they want it grown in the ground? Or they can even do a combination of that. We have several companies that do that, that do stuff in the container and in the ground or hanging basket in the containers. But anyway, so uh, they get to decide that. They also decide whether they're sending me seeds or uh, vegetative cuttings. Seeds start arriving and I sow them uh, back in January. And we continue to sow weekly until March and mid-March is when we start to get our vegetative cuttings. But that's enough of all that fun stuff. Let's start looking at some of the plants. Uh, hanging baskets, I've brought some over because I want y'all to be able to see them. We have, and I'm putting the label back in it so y'all can see it, this um, Magata Compact Dark Blue, which this Lobelia, I think it has such a an electric blue, and especially with this nice cloudy day, you can see the vividness of the, of the flower color on there. It's really nice. Beside it, we have uh, a Serfinia Purple Heart Petunia. And if you look at the dark purple, you'll, that's where you'll see the heart is. It's at the edges of the pe petals. So where they overlap, it forms a heart shape. And um, as we all know, Serfinias have been around for 30 years. They were the leaders in introducing the trailing or the hanging basket type uh, petunias. And they just continue to surprise and stun us uh, throughout these decades with different colors and flower patterns. And on the far right, well, that's my right, your left. We have um, this pot of pino. And when I was doing a little bit of research on this, I was quite surprised to see that this was an All-America selection winner from that's new this year. So last year, it was just a number. This year, it's been given this name, pot of pino. It is a small, fairly dainty little jalapeno. But the neat thing about it, and Alexander, I don't know if you're able to even hone in on this, but we have, uh, you can see the, the jalapeno that's formed there, the little baby one. It'll just continue to get bigger. We'll end up with uh, this plant supposedly covered with it. This is new to me, so we'll all take a look at this throughout the growing season. And what you're seeing at the very end here is the old blossom. So that's where the old flower was. Edibles are very important. We all know that they're still very much trending. People are wanting to grow their own. So things are being done in pots and containers. Uh, more, this is more of like a patio size plant. So um, people are, are interested in all the smaller or the more compact of the edibles. Doug, do you have anything you'd like to add about stuff? No. Um, 
are edible plants a new addition to the trials? Oh, thank you. Yes, actually they are for us and uh, also within the All-America Selection trials. This year they have branched out. Historically, they've only been in the ground or in the beds. This year they are now doing trials that are edibles in, well, they've done edibles in the ground, uh, but edibles in containers as well as ornamentals, the flowers in containers. And this is the first year we've ever been able to participate in the edibles because uh, edibles take really too much space. And I only have a small amount of, of um, turf here to work with. So, um, so they are new to us, but they're also new to All America Selection. They're uh, new, new as far as being grown in containers? No, new as to how we're trialing them. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, how about if we can look at the, on your backside here, this petunia, it's called Easy, I'm sorry, it's an E3 Easy Wave Blue. Uh, that we have reds, we've got a multitude of colors here. The easy, the E3 Easy Wave series is new this year. It's one that uh, Pan America has been working on. It's to, um, to extend their wave series. As you're aware that the, with the title of E3, that the E's are for their, um, it's early, because this is supposedly earlier flowering. It only needs about 10 hours of day length to flower. So it comes into flower earlier than a lot of the other series. They say the other E is for, I believe, efficient. And they say that's because it stays this nice tidy uh, shape as you can see here, but it will continue to crawl out over the pot. And then the last is for evolution. And there again, uh, that's to fill out the three E's, but the evolution of uh, the wave series. Um, uh, behind you was the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit about is the vincas. <coughs> and with the vincas here, this is part of a, a series, uh, Swari Kawaii, that's by Suntory. And in Japanese, Kawaii means cute. So these are, when they talk about this being a small, it's a small flowered plant and it's by, uh, once it gets going in the season, it'll just be covered and it stays covered throughout the season. It comes in a multitude of colors as well. Um, but uh, one of my favorites was the blueberry last year and then uh, the coral reef red was as well. And I think we're just gonna mention on the back side we have a bunch of containers. These are not all in the All America Selection trial test. These are also by some other companies, but you can see behind me, we have tomatoes, peppers, and uh, some basil back there. These are all being done in containers. Um, as I said, in the past, we've usually done all this stuff in, in the ground. The Thai basil at the very end is, I think, quite attractive, has lovely dark stems, very upright, very columnar and has that, um, what I've been told is a true Thai taste. It has that more licorice flavor to it. And you're awfully quiet, so I'm sure well, you have you're, you're more. Doing, you're doing such a good job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how about if we just continue on then? Bernadette, we have a question. Folks want to know if the Vinca is an annual or a perennial. It's an annual here. Uh, it's probably in South Florida, they maybe could keep it, but um, it's an annual for us. The cold will kill it. And it's a great plant for a hot, sunny, dry spot. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's like all your other vincas. It's it's just really a tough one that's uh, good for, as you said. I beg your pardon? And tell them deer don't touch it. Oh, and as I was reminded, yeah, the deer don't particularly care to eat the vinca. So, um, of course, you can prove me wrong. You may get them in your yard and they love it there, but uh, typically they don't. Any other questions before we move to the next? Bernadette, is, is this the peak of the display? No, the peak, I think, uh, oh, we, we planted uh, May 4th. So it's only been about four weeks since things have been in the ground or in these containers. Our peak generally is, mid to later part of June, probably through July, uh, August. Probably August is what I would, if I had to specify a time. Uh, with that said, last year, um, 
since nobody was here except for us, we had this gorgeous prolonged growing season. And last last year, it was like into the fall. We had petunias that were still looking fabulous. And usually the petunias fade out or rot out by um, August. So. Have you talked about um, evaluating the plants? No, I can do that here. I was going to do that a little further, but well, then, no, 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 no we'll this do is it good. A little bit further, then. This is good. Okay. Um, okay, evaluations are done on a weekly basis, and you may ask, "What are you trying? What are you looking for?" And um, what makes a good plant is uniform plant habit for uh, growth. Uh, consistent flower color across the board, floriferousness. So you want it to be uh, full of flowers. Like I was saying with the kawaii, it will end up being covered in flowers the whole season. Um, you are looking for things that are disease and insect resistant, things that tend to be, uh, that bounce back after a rain, that do better in that case. Uh, those are the things that primarily that you're looking for. And so my ratings are done on a weekly basis. At the end of the season, we compile all this data and it's put onto the JC Ralston Arboretum's website. So anyone that wants to look at past performance uh, is more than welcome to look on there. Just remember that each season is different. So you have to also look at the weather conditions. So something that might do well uh, one year, sometimes, it's better because of the growing conditions. Last year's prime example, we had a wet, cool lead in to the fall, to the summer, and that was sort of how we exited as well. And I think uh, we had some things that typically didn't wouldn't do well for us that were still with us and still alive. Marianne would like to know: Are the beds watered regularly? Yes, we're, we're actually on a time system. Uh, we have pop-up irrigation. They are watered um, as, well, it's, the irrigation is set for three or four times a week. And um, as I said, it's done automatically. So we're very fortunate in that. Except for when we first plant, everything is hand watered uh, to ensure that it settles in, the dirt settles around the root system. And with that said, a uh, big shout out needs to go to all of our volunteers because without our volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do these evaluations on this scope. It, we get everything planted in the ground uh, in one morning, one day. And uh, that's because a lot of help, helping hands and a lot of pre-planning. How, how long are we rating them? Oh, um, it, I think it's uh, 30, 30 or 45 minutes each time, I believe, except for the hanging baskets and they're like three minutes, three minutes. We're coming up on a zinnia that is, that has a backstory that I wanna tell y'all about on that side. Do you wanna go to the other side? Chris, Chris, the other side, you wanna be there. I just wanted to make sure I was at the right one. I'm sorry. Okay, this zinnia is an All-America selection winner. It is called, oh, I'm talking, but when you get here, no problem. It's called Profusion Red Yellow Bicolor. Uh, some of the volunteers might remember it from the end of the summer when they were allowed to come back. This was a stunner. I can't say enough good things about this plant. As, as you can see right now, it's just, uh, sort of nondescript. As we said, they've only been in the ground for four weeks, so they really haven't done anything other than settle in. But this, this flower changes as it's, as it's aging. It can go to an apricot. It could go to other pink shades. It's just stunning. And there again, it's part of the profusion series of uh, zinnias that have been around for a good while. But uh, what I wanted to tell you about it is it shows you how we have things that come in in the All-America selections as just a number. And then it's so popular. These, the data is collected not only from us, but from about 40, 50 other sites across the US with all America selections. That data is all pooled so they know growing conditions, varying growing conditions, and uh, they can test the performance one season and get a lot of data. But anyway, uh, no matter where this was grown across the US, 
it all had phenomenal um, reviews. And so last year it was a number. This year it was given what they call a gold winner status, which is a rare uh, award given by All America Selection. It's done for breeding breakthroughs. Uh, anyway, so it now has a name. So this is quite an honor. Uh, these these gold medal winners don't happen, but every few decades. So this is this is one that will continue to look great this whole season. But it's the profusion red yellow bicolor. Do you can you talk to them about the edibles behind you sure, at all? Absolutely. Um, and that way I'll be putting this back in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As Bernadette mentioned earlier, um, edible plants, fruits and vegetables, most, mostly vegetables have been part of the um, trials for decades. And this year, and it changes every year. Last year we had a phenomenal pepper and an eggplant that we don't have this year and I'm gonna sorely miss them. Um, but this year we have five or six different tomatoes. Some of them already have a bunch of green fruit on them and you know, too early to evaluate their productivity or the quality of the fruit, but um, we will ask others to twist our arms and um, taste some of these sun-ripened tomatoes. There's also um, two basils. This is the same um, tide tower basil that you saw over there in a pot. Um, but this is an a the common basil or Italian basil, but a really good selection called um, a mazel. Um, that's right, you all like to see the sign, don't you? Is that close enough, Alexander? Okay. Um, it's one that is not grown from seed, it's grown vegetatively. Um, basil is super easy to root. It's in that mid family with coleus and other things that are super easy to root. But the thing that makes this an outstanding basil is that in recent years, many seed strains of basils get off to a, a strong start, but by, by mid to late summer, the plants are dying from powdery mildew. I've, we've grown um, a basil basil a number of times, and it will still look perfectly clean on that day in October, or maybe early November when you rush out before it gets pitch black and pick the last of the basil because it's still that fresh and that good. So it's almost um, like a hedge because it's very uniform yeah. and it's pretty tall. Yeah, and it's it's a bit slower to uh, bloom than, um, than some of the seed strains. So if you've had problem growing basil, uh, a basil basil is great. There's another new selection, it's a, a selection of garlic chives called, um, well, the chives are um, same genus and onion and garlic, which is allium. And what did they call this one? Allium. Yeah, allium. <laughs> and it's definitely very garlicky. We don't know if it's how um, outstanding it is because this is our first experience with us. You know, we'll have a better idea come the end of the growing season. And I see a number of ornamental peppers at the end. Um, yes, so. and the ornamental peppers can still be eaten. It's yeah. just they're not grown for edibles. They're usually grown just for the foliage. And are, generally, they're very hot ones, aren't they? The ones I've had, yes. Yeah, the small yes. fruited ones are often very hot. And oh. from here, maybe we could talk about the sunflowers on the next bed. I don't know uh, if, they, if it doesn't come out very well. I just hate for us to keep moving. Okay, you can see initially we start out with a single stem, uh, your more typical sunflowers. Then you continue to the right, you'll pan and you'll see we have two bush-like. Those are the multi-stem sunflowers. Those, um, we had the sun credible yellow the last couple years here in That's the garden fun. and it is absolutely stunning once it, it's, multi-branching as we said it's covered in flowers and it stays like that up until fall the, yeah yeah the early fall and um we have a new one to the right of it it's called Sat sun credible saturn it has a brown pattern towards the center oh thank you doug towards the yeah, center it's a young flower but it's going to be covered as well since it's part of that sun credible series can you see it well enough alexander well here, here. 
it's but you know every year there's some real standouts in the in the color trials and a couple of years ago when that sun credible sunflower was in it, it just totally amazed me because it, as bernadette said it really does bloom up until frost well, last year, uh, since people couldn't come to the gardens, we were doing uh, Facebook and tweets and all that kind of stuff. Social media, sorry, the social media thing. And uh, I had the, the interns, we were lucky enough to have them come and join us the end of June, beginning of July. And I had asked them to please do things that we could post on Facebook and Twitter so that people could see the plant material in here. More, many times over, they all went to this sun credible, but that's when I told them, I said, please don't find something else because that thing is going to be with us at the end of the season and we can talk more about it then. But it's just, like I said, it's an eye catcher and uh, it's hard not to stop and appreciate it. Okay, well, uh, I do want, Oh, we must have another question. Or Brenda, I... We have someone that would like to know what company has done or in, created Suncredible, and is it done from seed or cuttings? Suncredible is a cutting, and it's from Proven Winners, yeah. right? Yeah, from Proven Winners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's one you ought to be able to find in the garden center mm -hmm. in a Proven Winners pot. Right, right. And so... despite being a hybrid, the flowers are highly visited by uh, bees, bumblebees mainly. Right. Yep. Often when plants are hybridized, the flowers are no longer attractive to pollinators. Well, um, I do want to move on to the terrenia, but I'm also looking a little bit past that and wondering with the rain stuff. So I may talk about the terrenia and just have you briefly take a picture. Stop there. Okay, uh, but it'll be a brief stop. Catherine says we got about 25 more minutes before it comes down. Okay, well, There's we'll- a weather alert. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we will try and get through with this as quickly as we can. Um, what I was gonna tell you is part of the All-America Selection Trials this year is this Terenia. It's uh, just has a number right now. So it really doesn't mean much of anything to you. It is a white, it's gonna be a clear white uh, a terenia, but people go, terenia, wait a second, that's only in the shade, because historically, we've always just grown it in the shade. They must be working on the genetics, because uh, that is something that the company wants All America Selection to, tra to, to uh, trial out in full sun. But I've had several people already asking me about that this, uh, this season when they've seen it, because it is unusual. It's like your sun patients, you can have those in sun or shade, uh, and you also have your regular patients, which we've all generally put in the shade, but there again, put enough water to them, you can put them out in, this, in the sun. Um, like I said, this was just sort of a short stop here because I'd had so many questions uh, the last couple of weeks about this. And as you just look across, I mean, you get to see what I like is all the color that's appearing and popping up in the trials. Uh, like I said, we have the volunteers that come and help and as we're planting i always remind them stand up stretch your back you know pretend you're a human again and uh look behind you because you see what you've already planted and it's just so rewarding to me to see us go from bare beds to to all the the color and the potential of all the color in here i was asked about the mulch the mulch we use uh Ground up, uh, actually, I don't even think they're ground up. They're just city leaves, aren't they? Well, from, from the university campus and okay. stuff, but I think we get some from the city as well. Okay. And from so, arborists. So it's just leaf mulch that we put down on them. Uh, many years ago, did a study with the weed guy uh, at NC State, and he was testing everything from pine straw, pine straw with herbicides, leaf mulch, leaf mulch with herbicide. Then they also had these wool pellets that they would throw down and with water would expand and, and uh, make a nice mulch. And they did that with paper as well. But lo and behold, at the end of the study, he found that the leaf mulch, the free leaf mulch was the just as effective as anything else uh, that they were using for uh, weed control. So we're very fortunate. We have access to this and can use it in the beds. Um, 
I do want to point out behind me over here, we have, oh, no, no, don't, because then he has to pan. Y'all got to stay together. We have five interns, but only four of them are here today. Uh, we're lucky that they have been with us the whole time, so we didn't have to put anybody off coming. Uh, we have them from multiple states, multiple backgrounds. Uh, just glad to have y'all. And say your first name, because we're on TV and you don't want to give your name out. Teresa. Hi, I'm Thomas. I'm Skylar and I'm Julio. Yeah, and we can't do what we do out here without their help throughout the summer as well. So we're just glad to have them. And a month from now, they will be leading this tour. Oh. They will be showcasing three, I won't say necessarily favorite plants, but three plants that they feel are worth uh, telling you about. It's always a really good tour. Yeah. Our fifth um, intern, Ty, is not here today, but he certainly will be here for the tour. Okay, so how about if we make one more stop and then we'll probably try and get someplace safe, I guess you're saying? Okay, okay. We're gonna head over to the far side of the alleyway here to the petunias. And some people may say, petunias, who cares about petunias? They've been around forever. There are so many different colors. Well, that's the beauty of them. There are so many colors. Uh, but we have several notable series. As we already talked about, the surfinias. The surfinias are known for their, um, like I said, uh, 30 years ago, introducing that trailing habit. But then we go to, um, like here, we have the supertunias. Supertunias are by, um, by proven winner and they came along about the early 2000 2005 six somewhere in there and most people are familiar with the super tunias they can get those at most of the big box places another few of them cover a big area we also have and i'm sorry i can't see it right off the top here it's called color rush color rush is another series that is fairly new it was introduced in 2017 uh, by ball and um, all of these are pretty much known for being vigorous growers having great root systems and uh, just having a multitude of flowers across them so um, like I said, we've got several several series that you can pick from. So you come and basically look and see what you think the color you color scheme fits best in your yard. But there is one in here that I was trying. Ah, uh, this one, this one down here. And I'm sorry, Alexander. I don't know if you could even see. It's the electric pink one right here. I think you can probably stay right there. Can you? No. Okay. And. It's, they call it a pet choa. And so it's a, it's a cross between uh, petunias and calabrocoas. And there again, calabrocoas, we know we've had some trouble in the landscape when they're in the ground, containers, they're okay. But apparently with this cross, they're saying that um, this is the one to go to. So anyway, I just want to make sure I point it out there. That's really gonna be one to, um, keep track of. I didn't know we had a hybrid between Petunia and Calabrocoa. Well, I've, did I, and they say it's a new genus. So. Well, it's a hybrid genus, but um, yeah. occasionally some of the Calabrocoas will act more like a perennial, and we have some that are many years old. I, for one, I mean, this is the first year I've had uh, Calabrocoa come back in my own yard at home. I have one plant, and for as many years we've been doing this, I've never had them overwinter. Yeah. Other people have had no problems, but I yeah. have. The petunia behind me is part of the Color Rush series that I said was introduced in 2017 by Ball. This year they have a new, it's called Merlot Star, and I just think that is such a beautiful and interesting flower pattern. Pattern. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this fills out. Uh, I think it'd be stunning if we do have it be, you know, have it as it's growing become wall to wall flowers on the foliage. Okay, so Doug, anything else you want, can help me out with here? Well, over yonder, I noticed some perennials. Are perennials part of this color trial? Yes, we do uh, perennial trials. As you can, if you're scanning out behind us, you'll see the white salvias. We've got to the far right, the penstemon. We have quite an assortment of different perennials. Uh, perennials are usually in the ground for uh, 
three, two full years, the third spring, that flush, I do a survival count and uh, then they're removed. We, there again, that's another report that is put out on the JC Ralston Arboretum's website. And apparently we've got to go because this rain is getting ready to come hard. Do you want to so, go to the, do you want to go to the year since it's nearby? Uh, were there any questions actually? Let me think. Um, okay, so we can talk about tropicals. We all know tropicals are like an in thing. And uh, Tim and the interns, I believe, planted a bed out here. So that's a, like a little tease for Tim's talk later this summer about tropicals. But you as a homeowner can make your own little tropical oasis by just putting in some uh, elephant ears by putting in some cannas, anything that's big and um, sort of in your trace, face, leaf trace, foliage. You uh, then you can put in sweet potatoes. You can put in uh, New Guinea impatience. Um, let me think. What are some other things? Uh, you can do the grasses, the cannas, as I said. Okay, I think we're heading inside to make sure we all stay safe during this next downpour. Um, so uh, I think questions maybe, is that? Oh, okay, well, okay, well. We are a lot closer to the highway construction noise. I think what they have, it sounds like a great big um, floor sander, but I think it's pro its purpose is probably to generate uh, dust, uh, soil dust, yeah. Okay. They'll be okay. Okay. Um, okay. Go ahead. Well, I can say. So, uh, someone's asked, uh, what kind of potting soil do you use in the containers? Well, I have to be honest. You sort of caught me. We use uh, a bag mix because it is supplied to the university. So I can't say that I have preference of one over another. These are donate. This is donated material, and I believe was it the Fafford Four P or something like that. Well, Fafford is a company that's no longer in business, but this is the company that bought Fafford. And oh, Old Castle. Is what? Is it Old Castle? I don't know if it's Old Castle. Okay. Old Castle bought all the mulch and stuff. Okay. Um, well, anyway. Jolly so Gardner, does, it, does that sound right for the bag soil we use? Jolly Gardner or something like that? It's a soilless mix, so there's no actual dirt or earth in it. It's based on bark and perlite and peat moss and some so sort of clean. combination. So it's clean, your hands come out clean from playing yeah. with it. <laughs> um, you know, it's comparable to, uh, well, it's fairly comparable to something like miracle Grow potting soil, any good bag potting soil. That you can get at yeah. any of the big box. And right. any of those potting soils are fairly expensive. Um, I usually extend it extend it with pine bark vines. You can buy pine bark vines for about three dollars for a bag and I use up to half to three parts of pine bark vines with one part of a soilless potting mix. Okay. And by popular demand, folks are wanting to know more about the perennials. And that's <laughs> a lot of people asking about that. That's only because they weren't shown anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, we I already said that I do them for two full years, the third spring, their survival count, the final survival count is taken. Uh, we grow them just to see how they perform in this part of the Southeast forest. Um, we have your typical cone flowers. Well, when I say that, sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's typical. It's, it's cone. We have cone flowers. I love the cone flowers. We have a variety of different colors and different flower types. Uh, we have the salvias that seem to do well for us. We, the monardas, it just goes on and on. I'm going, yeah. what, uh, the heucheras. And that'll be an interesting thing because we have so many of the heucheras, the coral bells that are out in full sun. And um, maybe, and Bernadette, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's the case that we do not select what we plant the companies say, I have these six different plants and I want you to trial them. And they might be something that we know is not gonna do well. Like when they send us larkspur or 
lupins in the spring, we know that in the Southeast, the time to plant those is in October, not in April. Um, but we dutifully plant what they supply. So especially in the perennial area, you'll see some blank spots where the particular type of plant they send sent did not uh, you know, last their first summer or something. Well, we also don't know their reason for some of the things that we anticipate dying. Uh, to reference a point in time, when I first started, I was talking with a gal from Cicada one time and said that I always held back the pansy seeds because they sent them for the summer sowings. And it's like, why? I mean, first of all, we have so many other beautiful plants to select from, but they'll die. Our heat and humidity yeah. kill them. And she was just aghast because she goes, oh, no, we're breeding them for heat tolerance. So oh. she said we wanted to see how long in the season we could get. So sometimes we don't understand why and we know it's going to die. They do, too. But they're doing some behind the scenes works. I'm trying to give them credit. <laughs> well, you know, the, the nurseries and seed companies supplying the seeds and plants are from other parts of the not only country, but world. And right. certainly, you know, in the colder parts of the country, you don't plant things like pansies and larkspur in the fall. You plant them in the spring. Right. But here we plant them in the fall. Right, right. What other questions? Someone would like to know more about the shade trials you do. Okay. The plants that are in the shade, as I said earlier, the company gets to tell me where they want their plant material trialed. So whether they want it in the shade or out in full sun. And so it's based on the company preference. And if it's under the shade, it, we do, we have hanging baskets that we have in the shade. So if they want to put it as a hanging basket or a container that can go in the shade as well. All of that is automatic watering as long as I turn the valve, it's automatic. Mm. <laughs> and two other requests are best performing salvias and best oh. performing eucharists. Got any ones that you know of judge really highly? We have a new heuchera that's out there that's called Steel City. That we, it's, this is its second year. I like it. I think it's really nice. It's, um, it has a lot of flowers on it. Right currently it's blooming and a uh, nice compact mound. Uh, I still like the Forever Red Heuchera, but that one, we're down to two out of the original 12 plants. It's just got a beautiful reddish color. Early in the morning, you can see the light coming behind the leaves and it's really pretty. It's beautiful during the winter months. Um, and as for salvia, uh, there, there are too many. I, I well, um, uh, the unplugged series, I think, is pretty, is nice, um, but it depends on what kind of salvia they want and where they want it, how tall they want it. Yeah, the salvia genus is huge. Um, there certainly um, was the question specifically about perennial salvias. Well, we're talking about the color trials. So anyone that's in the color trials of Bernadette's life, which I think would be probably most ones that are treated as an ant. But you can add your favorite salvias since you like salvias quite a bit too, Doug. Well, there are new, new selections of the mealy cup sage, which is salvia farinacea, as in farina, a flower, F-L-O-U-R, <laughs> mealy cup sage. Um, they were submitted um, as an annual, and certainly in a zone six or colder, they would not survive the winter, but Salvia farinacea generally survives the winter here. So um, was that the unplugged series? It, yeah, the yes, unplugged yes, series. Yes. The blue one is uh, so blue. Plant cultivar names are so confusing nowadays because you have the name of the series and then the name of the particular selection within that series. And I don't remember if the robust white one was also in the unplugged series. I don't think we, it is, but I don't know. Yeah. But um, I know they have an unplugged so blue, uh, pink because yeah. I have that this year, yeah. so pink. I'm uh, curious to see how pink that will be. I was looking through notes just to make sure I covered most everything. And I know I told y'all that we start sowing seeds in January and then the, the vegetative material comes in March. 
Uh, but uh, just for historical perspective, when I first started, everything was seed, and now our entries, three-fourths of them are vegetative cuttings, and only about a quarter of them are from seed. So uh, things have changed tremendously over the last several decades. Um, One of the participants commented that hardy hibiscus are growing in popularity, and I'm wondering if you've trialed any of those. Um, that cranberry. Uh, Lace bark, cranberry, or There's something. one that's been in the perennial trial for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. um, last week, we received um, two other herbaceous hardy hibiscus from a, another nursery for trial, though they're not specifically part of the color trials. We will trial them. And that same nursery sent us one selection last year. Um, you know, I've never... I've never known one of the hardy herbaceous hibiscus to not do well. They're usually pretty uh, reliable foolproof. Yeah, yeah, very reliable. I think they're some of the breeders are making them too short. I want a hibiscus that's about five feet taller, or not 18 inches tall. That's sort of the trend, is everything is being- Stumpified. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say is being dwarfed for containers for patios because people's living spaces, their outside living spaces have gotten so much smaller. But I agree with you, they've lost that proportion. And so you see something and it's great that it's wall-to-wall -wall flowers, but it looks like it's this hand or fist at you that's just color or whatever. So I do like when you can sort of have a nice balance. One other thing, um, when you talked about the mulch earlier, uh, in case anybody wants to know about fertility, we do um, do a liquid feed once or twice, and that's with 2020 through a dosatron, which is a proportioner. And um, we do that to help make sure that all the plant material gets off to a good start. And then probably two other times throughout the summer, I'll put out calcium nitrate. Um, that's over the top. I just put it in a little hopper and go over. And the reason I do that is because um, I learned the hard way years ago that when I used um, the nitrate based, the uh, urea based uh, rather uh, fertilizer, I burned all of the begonias once one year because um, I, didn't water in everything afterwards. I had just put it out and it was supposed to rain. Well, we didn't get the rain. And the next day when I came out, they were already, because of the, the prills had turned to liquid in the base of the cups, they were already burning. And so, so I switched over to calcium nitrate years ago. <laughs> Another participant has asked, what are some of your favorite plants that have come through the uh, shade trials? Shade trials, yeah. the polka dot plant. I like the polka dot plant. Uh, years ago, what I'm what I have seen over the years is stuff that was in the greenhouse when I was uh, growing up. Those are all they've been transitioned outside now. And the polka dot plant to me, I just think it's nice and funky. It's just you know you got the green little leaf with the splatterings of um, intense magenta and uh, the white one though that one tends to look a little dirty from distance, but the pink one is is nice. So that's probably of, of those that I found interesting. Oh, I can hear I, it. I can't think of any plant that really stands oh. out to me from the shade trials. I'm pretty excited about some of the Rex type begonias we have this year, but those, this is our first year with them. And those are going to be awesome. The and flower pat or the leaf patterns are awesome. But I just thought no of something. No one asked me, but I like caladiums. Oh, the caladiums last year were outstanding, were outstanding. But as Doug, you pointed out last year, the breeding of uh, caladiums is done out in full Florida sun. So why do we have them in the shade if that's where they're doing all of that work? So, Well, it's like a lot of plants we grow in shade. It's only because we never tried them out in sun. Yeah. Uh, there was something else when we were talking about in the shade that I wanted to. Oh, uh, impatience. As we all know, back around 
I think it was 2008, 2010, uh, downy mildew became a huge problem in impatience. And they basically disappeared from the landscape within a year's time because they it was sure crop failure if you planted them. So landscapers struggled for finding things to put out in place of the impatience. The um, companies worked very diligently trying to find a downy mildew resistant strain and that beacon series that we have out there is one of them we had that last year was the first year i had the whole series and never had a problem with the with downy mildew i did on one or two of the non beacon series but that's probably something that would be of interest i love impatience and i'm i was glad to see them come back into the onto the list of possibilities well, um, perhaps somebody in the audience is going to ask this question, but I'll ask it. Um, talking about powdery mildew on impatience and stuff, do you ever spray any of the trials for diseases or insects? No, I'm incredibly lazy. I don't oh, want to. No, no, that's not the right answer, <laughs> No, no. Uh, no, we don't, because most homeowners don't either. And so well, we're trying to sort of replicate what would be typical um, growth or, or habits with the, with these plants. So we, we don't do that. Um, I do put out fertilizer. We do uh, put out water uh, as opposed to just saying it's feast or famine for them. Matter of fact, they'd probably all be dead if we didn't do automatic watering since, as everybody knows, up until just now, we haven't had rain or any appreciable amount of rain for months. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of yeah, and, and, and you don't spray for insects or, or diseases because we need to see whether or not these plants are going to resist such things or not. Oh, that's true, too. Yeah. And it's it's noted when we do have problems, like uh, with the Cleomies, you have the harlequin bugs. When they start appearing, you know the Cleomies are not going to be with us for long because the harlequin bug is a, vector, is a vector for this virus and they feed on the Cleome and they in, um, inject their this virus infected sap into it or uh, spit into the sap and the, the Cleome dies. So yeah, we do need to know what will live and what attacks what out in the garden. We have questions about rabbits from two people. Catherine has commented that she's seen a lot of rabbits over here at the Arboretum, big ones. I was wondering if any of the plants have been eaten by them. And another person has asked, do you use anything to keep the deer and rabbits away? Okay. Um, yes, we do have a problem with the rabbits. And matter of fact, Tuesday, yesterday, when the volunteers were going through the gardens, I stopped because I saw a rabbit go through the conifer area. And I swear it was a cat. It was huge. This rabbit was huge. Um, I, I don't like them in my garden. Um, they can live elsewhere, but I don't particularly care for them. And yes, uh, I think I already have them eating Plectranthus, but we were talking about that earlier. Typically, Plectranthus isn't eaten by wildlife, but I've got something that's munched on uh, some of the Plectranthus. Yeah, we have a inordinate number of rabbits in the garden, fewer than back in the spring, I guess something's getting them. I do sorely miss our coyotes. Um, <laughs> they were caught and um, transported elsewhere, but when we had coyotes, we had fewer rabbits. And um, knocking on wood, um, we haven't had much impact from deer. About a year ago, there was a doe and a young fawn in the garden and with the highway construction, they cut down all the trees between the highway and um, the Arboretum. And I think that's why the deer uh, showed up in the garden. Tim did see a deer, I think just one deer, once in Asia this Valley, spring. Wasn't it yeah. Asia? Um, but we're hoping they don't become a problem. Well, last year um, in, in the shade, they methodically went across the hanging baskets oh, that's and right. ate them. Yeah, and that, so each right. day you'd come in, there'd be like another two or three yeah. that would be munched on. And I called it coming to the salad bar yeah. because it was like right level for them. They didn't have yeah. to bend over or anything. That's right, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you have found it effective, but 
I've when, used it, but I haven't. Okay. Um, you know, the repellents work all right on deer. I'm not, I don't have experience with repellents in deer. Repellents work fairly well on rabbits. You can buy things specifically made as repellents. I often use a very fine dusting of blood meal or melorganite. Melorganite is um, composted sewage sludge. It's a whole lot cheaper than blood meal and it's fairly readily available, certainly at the big box retailers. And if you think about it, you probably wouldn't eat your salad if somebody sprinkled um, composted sewage sludge on it. And I think the rabbits feel much the same way. <laughs> I used it last summer because I was having a problem. Yeah. That's what you gave me. And um, they were munching through a lot of stuff. I've had them eat the scavola fan flower. I've had them eat clover, which we was really no surprise, but I had those growing in not last year clovers, too. Yeah, yeah, the ornamental clovers. And they kept them neatly trimmed to the edge of the pot. Um, but uh, verbenas, they've, they've gone and eaten on a lot of things over the years. Carol's wondering, are there any new hydrangeas in the trials? And Doug, since there probably isn't any hydrangeas in the trials, are any new hydrangeas in the gardens that you like? Um, and that's correct. There woody is plants aren't part of the trials. So no, there aren't any hydrangeas in the trials. The, the trials are just um, herbaceous plants, annuals and herbaceous perennials. Uh, new hydrangeas in the Arboretum. I don't know, have, have we gotten new hydrangeas? Um, I don't know if Tom did anything recently. I don't believe so, okay. yeah. Um, the Arboretum has a huge selection of hydrangeas. A lot of the serratas are being real pretty right now. And Catherine's asked, and she may have missed it, I did too. Uh, are the beacon impatients, are they going to be good for sun at all? I know they have in the shade, but are they ones that's labeled for sun? Good question. I I don't, I can't answer that. I don't know. Are they uh, ones that look like straight? Um, yeah, the wallerina? Mm -hmm. Probably yeah. not then. It's it's the things with um, New Guinea impatients in it that are sometimes sun tolerant. Yeah. Is I, that your impression? I was going to say yes, but... Um, but, but with that said, so many things, they still put them outside. And as long as they are able to put them on irrigation, they, they'll they live. But um, I, I have no experience with it, so I don't know. A participant noted that you talked about some tropicals in the display bed. And he's wondering if, are you, if you are trialing any tropicals anywhere within it, within the trials. Well, yes, we have the canna. We got a canna out there. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what you're going to call a tropical. We have some... Um, some of the sun patients, which have the New Guinea crossover in them, yeah. um, uh, you got you have plants that uh, I guess you can call them tropical. But I'm I'm sitting there going, um, some of the well, I'll say the grasses give it a tropical feel. They're not necessarily tropical. Um, um, an awful lot of the plants we grow as annuals are actually tropical perennials whether herbaceous perennials or woody perennials. Um, a true annual, something like those single stem sunflowers or chickweed or larkspur or a lot of the poppies, a true annual grows from seed uh, to full maturity, flowering and setting seed and then dying in one year's time. Now that year might be during the frost free months or it might be something like poppies and larkspur and chickweed and henbit, which germinate in late summer and fall, grow all winter, bloom in late winter and spring, set seed and die. Those are true annuals. A lot of the things we grow as annuals are tropical plants and we treat them as annuals because the frost kills them. So we've only had them for one year, but in a frost-free climate, they would be perennials. Um, you know, the list is huge. Um, lantana, coleus, uh, plectranthus, caladiums, um, savola, elephant ears, ears cannas. Um, I would say if we went through the garden of, of the things we think of as annuals, maybe almost two thirds of them would be tropical plants that we treat as annuals. I think, um, you know, a lot of 
a true annual, you think of zinnias in a long season, you start them in April, and maybe by August, they're starting to look real tired. Well, they're true annuals. They've accomplished their goal in life. They've produced seed. They're, they've accomplished their uh, goal in life, and they're ready to take a rest and go to zinnia heaven. Um, <laughs> but something that's a tropical perennial, well, one thing, a lot of them are really grooving on that hot, humid weather of August and September. Mm -hmm. And they're ready to keep on going all year. And they're only slowed down when it starts to get chilly at night in, you know, October, um, and then finally killed off by frost. But the vast majority of things we treat as annuals are tropical plants. And Bernadette was talking earlier about the polka dot plant, Hypoestes. And it's a case where it's something that old timers have grown for a long time as a house hey, plant. Hey. I'm Listen. the old timer. <laughs> You're the spring chicken. Um, um, you know, those are things we always thought of as houseplants. And then one day somebody said, well, let's try it outside. When I was a kid, I grew a coleus as a houseplant. Never thought to plant it outside. And now coleus are ubiquitous. But that's coleus are another tropical perennial. And they're another great one because they yeah. have a variety of colors, patterns on the leaf. Very versatile plant. That was it for the questions in the chat. So it's okay. like this is it for everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Bernadette and Doug, for giving us a great tour through the color trials. And we're ecstatic that it's raining out there. I'm are thrilled. Yeah. 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 Yes. You might want to show the audience rain in case they don't want <laughs> <remember laughs> what it looks like. Can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. And please come out, those that can, and see the uh, plants as they progress through the season because yeah. they will change. Yeah, the Arboretum is open, so you can come out and see, visit all these things. And speaking of being open, in case you didn't see it, this weekend is our first weekend of being open, 10 a.m. through 6 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Thank you so much. See you all thank next you. week with Mark's Midweek with Mark. Thank you. Bye, Bye, thank everyone. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.